Well, good morning and welcome everybody to this panel. Uh, we're here today to talk about how we can use 5G in production. I'm John Ellerton. I'm head of futures here at BT Media and Broadcast. I'm also chair of SIMPTI in the UK. Um, I'm joined by Andy Beale, chief engineer at BT Sport, by Hello. David Edwards, um, who's live production and 5G product manager at Vizlink. Hello. And Paminda Gantu, technology transfer and partnerships manager at the BBC Edge Group lead from the BBC. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So let's, let's make a start. So first of all to Paminda, what's the big story here? Why is 5G NPN such a big thing? So first of all, I'll explain what an NPN is. That stands for a non-public network. Um, broadca as broadcasters, we've been using mobile technology for a really long time now. We've become really adept at using it to do things like mobile journalism, um, bonded cellular connectivity for contribution from out in the field. And with the advent of 5G, what we wanted to do was engage, be able to engage um, through our work with the standards bodies, etc., to be able to ensure that everything that's being promised by 5G is actually going to be realized. And as we've done our testing and trialing and investigations into this, technology, what we've realized is that, yeah, we need a non-public network because that gives us a ring-fenced level of connectivity that's not going to be um, interfering with the public network, not going to be contested when we're uh, trying to do coverage at events where there's a lot of public uploading to social media, congesting those cell towers. So in a nutshell, that's why NPNs are really, really important for us. Splendid. And so let's turn to David then and talk about RF, because using radio networks to backhaul camera pictures, well, we can do that already, right? We don't need a 5G network for that. So, so what's the difference? Mm. So I think these wireless cameras have been used for many years to, to bring video pictures right at the heart of the action, to get in amongst the action, to bring the excitement of live sports alive to people. And people have been using this technology, as you say, for, for a number of years with OFDM technology at the sideline of a sports pitch with bonded cellular, maybe for live reporting, those sorts of applications. But what 5G brings is it, it enables us to keep all of the properties that those technologies have already. So OFDM has a, has a reputation for lowest latency, highest quality, an uncontested network. 5G can give us all of those properties but it can add something else, which is the world of IP. And IP has been spreading amongst everything that we've been doing in broadcast for really quite a number of years now. And a 5G private network or non-public network gives you that gateway right, um, right to the edge of the network, right to the camera operator, so you can do so many more things. You have the ability for bi-directional connectivity, you have the ability for IP connectivity into the camera and associated devices around that. And I think that's one of the core properties that 5G brings to the market that you couldn't get with some of the other technologies that have been well trusted and relied upon. Yeah, splendid. Now we've got some kit here, we've got a couple of different types mm. of camera, we've got a 5G cell, we've got the antenna, so we can talk about all of this as we go along a little bit, but maybe first of all, Andy, let's talk a bit about the trials that we've done. What, what have, what, uh, what's happened so far in the industry in terms of uh, testing and trialing this technology? Yeah, thanks, John. So we did, um, we've been playing with 5G with various partners for, uh, for quite a long time, and we started off in 2018, in fact, with a, with a sort of pseudo, it, wasn't, it, was not, it was actually public EE network, but given the lack of proliferation of devices at the time, it might as well have been private. So we always tried that at Wembley with an eight camera remote AB successfully. And so we knew that, um, to David's point, we know there was opportunity there. One forward a few years post pandemic, we decided to try a proper non-private network in a really busy congested stadium in a real life sporting event up against all the contention and the crowd and all the complication and noise of a big sporting event. So we went to uh, Saracens, um, Rugby Football Club in North London, and we built, uh, with the help of uh, Mobile Viewpoint and Broadcast RF and yourselves, mm -hmm. uh, a private 5G network which covered the whole of the pitch area. And what we did, we took a standard um, uh, wireless radio camera with the Vizlink backpack uh, 5G link on. We left on the Cofton 
block in the middle, just in case, because you can, you can stack them up, which is one of the, one of the interesting things about the approach. And we were able to compare, but good for two things, because we could have a bit of confidence that if for some reason the 5G didn't perform as we hoped it would, <laughs> we knew we wouldn't be uh, letting down all the BT Sport customers at home. Um, but also we could compare things like latency and pitch quality directly side by side in the real environment where you've got camera operators running up and down the side of the pitch shooting um, presentation with presenters and also getting shots during the actual game as well um, up behind the throw in and everything else, those sorts of angles that we get. And, you know, we were, we were delighted. It worked really, really well. We had um, work first time. Um, I had, had great looking pictures and it went to where no problem. Yeah. Would you use it again? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, it was good. And, and, and to David's point, the interesting thing about the IP is that you can start to add other devices which are really useful. So traditionally, you have to have a complicated RF specialist monitor pitch side for a presenter, um, which requires a different RF operator, so there's more cost and labour involved in that and equipment. Well, now you can just put out a 5G connected device like an iPad with a private SIM in it, and suddenly you've got a low latency WebRTC or whatever technology, uh, low latency return monitor on devices which are much more accessible and easier to operate. And this is where it gets interesting, right? It's not just a like for like replacement for an RF network, you can do so much more. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's, let's talk a bit about the Commonwealth Games then, Perminda, because that's the next thing that we all kind of moved on to testing. What was different about that one? Um, so what we were able to do in conjunction with BT Media and Broadcast and uh, Vizlink through their mi mobile viewpoint product was uh, again set up the private network. We had a BT Open Reach fibre backhaul and it created our own um, private hub where we were able to have two roaming cameras, we were able to cover the whole of Victoria Square and actually what we found was that the range that we had was much better than expected. We were working with two antennae which gave us that extended range. Um, also, it was an opportunity to test in a real world condition. So, Commonwealth Games, there's going to be a lot of public in that area. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it was also about the spectrum that we were able to use. So, we were working in a range of the spectrum that Ofcom reserves for testing and trialing. So, we weren't anywhere near where the public 5G um, network for those that might have devices in that range. And yeah, we were able to absolutely prove our proof of concept. It was very, very successful. We went live into the one show for the Baton Relay. Uh, we also did a live interview with Tom Daly over the 5G network and we were sending <laughs> two cameras back with the um, ability for the uh, gallery to be able to cut between those two cameras if they wanted to do. And I think we were getting, remind me how many megs up? 150 megs up. Um, so yeah, uh, we could in fact lower the bandwidth and increase the amount of cameras, but being able to configure that private network so that we had higher uplink than downlink, because as we all know, consumer uh, 5G is tuned towards you know down download speeds for uh, most of the public's use. So that's really really vital for us being able to do that part of the equation. 150 megs up, so that's pretty significant, isn't it? And essentially what we were doing there was uh, remote production, a couple of cameras yep. being cut in the gallery and broadcasting house. Yeah, absolutely. And so in 2020, when we started with the IBC accelerators, sort of beginning to inv investigate what the potential of 5G remote production might be, we actually did a live proof of concept from here in Amsterdam, and we were able to get a slice of the network through Vodafone Ziggo, but actually, having a slice of the network, it's not really a business model that the mobile network operators are able to provide mm. right now. In the UK, certainly Vodafone are probably one of the only uh, operators that are building any standalone network. So slicing, which is having a guaranteed uh, bandwidth within the public uh, network, hasn't really been something that's played out in the way that it might be. Um, in terms of what's going on with the standards work, we're still working through all of that. Um, and we will continue to engage with that through our work with 3GPP, 5G records, and to ensure that what we need is what we end up with. Very good. Let's talk a bit about the kit then. So we've got a couple of different cameras here. And as I say, we've got the, um, the cell itself. Mm. David, why don't you talk us through um, what we've got here and a couple of different use cases that, yes. that we, can, we can use this for. Okay, so here right beside me, we've got a, um, a 5G core and a 5G radio and a, a 5G antenna. And this gives you effectively a network in a box that you can take along to your location and deploy really rapidly. In terms of the sort of coverage area, 
um, we deployed um, a network just the same as this within the Saracen Stadium, and that gave us the ability to have roaming cameras within the space of that stadium complex. So that gives you an idea of the sort of range. It's the range that you might need for any sporting stadium-based event, and clearly you can deploy larger scale systems for other applications. Um, next to me, um, I've got this camera here. It's an ENG type camera, a more news type camera, which has a, a mobile viewpoint transmit on, on the back of this. And this device is capable of working both across the, the private 5G network and the public cellular network. And, it could, and, and one of the things we were able to test at the Commonwealth Games was actually moving between the private and the, um, uh, the public networks and seeing how, how you could move between those, those two type of networks. Furthest away from me, I've got um, a studio camera or other sort of cameras that are used running up and down the pitch lane at sporting events. And that has attached to it a VisLink transmitter and as Andy was describing, it's, um, it's a device that um, has OFDM technology on it, as people have been doing for a number of years, and, have, and clipped onto the back of that a 5G transmitter. And so the way often that sports productions are, are operated, um, there are guys who are specialists in te technology, they may find that they're doing OFDM one day and 5G the next, as depending on how how rapidly people move and migrate across to 5G technology. So both um, um, capabilities are there. And so it gives um, people the ability to do sports types broadcasting, pitch lane, pitch side broadcasting with the camera on the right, and maybe more interview type applications with the one on the left. And so is there a difference in latency between the two? Is that the reason for the specialism? So 5G itself, one of the properties of a private 5G network is that you can get very low latency across it. We're talking maybe 10 milliseconds, that sort of latency, which is really great for that immediacy of sports, between cutting between a wireless camera and, and a fixed line camera. Um, in terms of the technologies, it happens that the, um, uh, the ANG type solution, the what has been traditionally bonded cellular devices use software-based encoding that's inherently slightly longer encoding latency, whereas the, uh, the sports-type solution, the visiting type solution, uses hardware-accelerated encoding, and so end-to-end, -end, that solution furthest away from me can give you, a, on a 5G network, um, an end-to-end -end latency of a little more than a, a video frame. Mm, very good. So let's talk, Andy, a bit about the, the challenges and the opportunities here. So we, we talked a bit about licensing, and uh, is that easy? So, uh, well, I've only done it once. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, you yeah, know, for the, so for the, for the uh, Saracens example, we, we just booked the N77 Spectrum from Ofcom. It's a regional license for that, for that um, particular geographic location. Um, in, there is, was in the UK, there is Spectrum reserved. Uh, by Ofcom for this use, for this non-private use, um, so it's really, readily available. Um, so it's just a question of acquiring it, and it's uh, unbelievably cheap as well <laughs> compared to a Cofton license, and is and is valid for much longer. And and is it quick to set up? Can you can you do it um, with little notice, or does it take a few so weeks? So the, the application process is far longer than the than the um, the actual process of configuring the uh, the, the frequencies yes. in the box, which is about five seconds. I think you have to have two weeks' notice for the Ofcom legislation. Okay, that's so, helpful. Yeah. yeah. And then let's talk about device compatibility. So I mean, we're featuring um, VisLink uh, equipment here. Uh, and does it work with other vendors? Is that easy to make stuff interoperate? So we've, we've tried two different vendors. Both have just interrupted fine. Um, there was a little bit, when we had the very first version of this, David loves to keep me honest here because it was your product, but there was a little bit, when we, had, when, we, when we first worked on this project, we started a year ago actually at um, MotoGP event in Silverstone. So the first event we tried it on, was about a year before Saracens, where we put the cell on the outside of the last corner. We thought we'd try something a bit more interesting with the high-speed um, nature of the bike. So we had this, this camera with this back on for walking up and down the pit lane and doing presentation from the, from the starting grid. But we also put an antenna on the back of one of the bikes to see how that would perform. Um, and that was a really new version, and there was a little bit of um, R&D work. It was so new, wasn't it, David? Maybe, maybe you can yes. pick up on it in a minute, but um, to, to get it dialed in. But I think that was just because it was still in the R&D phase. That was, that's not an operational thing, was it? At not all? an operational thing, no. I mean, 5G is, is a standard, and, and everyone has implemented two standards, and most people implement with the same idea of what the standard actually implies. Mm -hmm. uh, so in terms of interoperability, we have um, tested now with a number of um, 5G cell devices, 
across the, the trial at, at um, the Commonwealth Games and the trial at Saracens, and we're finding that all of the technology is playing really nicely together, even at this early stage within um, the technology's lifetime. Yeah, very good. And so let's think about other applications then for the 5G network. Uh, we've done cameras, we've done talkback. Would you see a time when we'd be putting the mics across the 5G network as well? Yeah, yeah definitely. I think yeah. so. I, mean, I, th I talked about monitoring. I think devices like pitch side monitoring for uh, presenter monitors, I think things like analysis portals where we have this exact problem where pitch side presenters at the minute want to do um, real-time analysis into a device like Piero or other analysis devices are available. But, um, and trying to do that on a Wi-Fi network for an iPad is, is difficult because Wi-Fi gets extremely contended in venues. When you have 20,000, 40,000 fans turn up with their phones all with the Wi-Fi switched on, they're all trying to poll your, your Wi-Fi hotspot. Mm. And so it doesn't, just doesn't really work. So we think, again, putting those sorts of control devices onto a private SIM in that iPad, onto a private, it was, is a really exciting opportunity to finally bring some of those tools pitch side where we've had to be locked away in the studio previously. I definitely think we'll see microphones very soon. I know Sennheiser are working on one at the minute, so yeah. I think we'll see that in probably later this year or next year. Yes. Um, Try what else we'd have: <laughs> audio, video, monitoring. And I think I think potentially, you know, there's questions there as to whether you would then extend the sort of what are traditionally wireless cameras and, and cover cameras with 5G in other ways. You, I could imagine little point of view cameras. I could potentially even imagine that we could, people could start to conceive the idea of um, decoupling what are today's fixed cameras and clipping 5G onto the back of that. And potentially, if we are doing remote production, one of the reasons for rolling a truck out to a stadium is to give somewhere to interface all of those, those fixed cameras into. And potentially, you can now just bring all of those things back with your 5G gateway back into your broadcast center and maybe it's, it's just a matter of connecting everything. To yeah, the and the benefit network. of that model with the private network, with this type of solution, backhauled with some, some uh, high quality um, connectivity, is that the latency is consistent across all devices. Whereas right. if you use a traditional cellular model, where every device has got a, has got a backpack on, although we can dial that in to be fairly accurate, it's never going to be frame accurate. And so you have to do alignment and other complicated things in a sporting world where you want actually synchronicity. Um, whereas here you get, uh, you know, it's, as the timeline is so tight, as David said, you can guarantee they'll all be available. Excellent. within the right window. Yes, Excellent. you don't want to be switching a camera to something that has a different latency and seeing a goal being missed or seeing a ball being kicked again. It's very difficult for the producer to tell the story in that, in that sort of, mm -hmm. of operation. But if everything is almost seamless, almost low latency and almost synchronized together, then you can create something which is a, a very um, compelling program to, to view. I think I mean, the also the other thing is, you know, it's not, it's not just sport. I mean, the advantage of having that private network that's so uh, mobile and so quick and easy to set up means that we can respond quickly to things like breaking news. We can consider covering the kinds of events that maybe we didn't have access to before because getting a truck in, getting crew in, all of this leads to um, improvements in terms of sustainability as well. You know, the carbon footprint of running something like this mm. is going to be far less than sending a truck, sending lots of people, hotels, flights, other mm. travel, etc. So the ripple effect is, is quite, quite large. And just in terms of sort of production flexibility, if a story is changing, having that flexibility and mobility and being able to move to where, where the action is happening in lots of uh, content scenarios, not just sports. Mm. Well, let's, so let's talk about getting the pictures back then, because we've talked about within the stadium, within the local area, being able to roam around with um, 5G cameras attached to the cell. But if we haven't got network slicing, then we need a way of getting the pictures back to the studio over the wide area. Now, of course, we can use uh, a network, and Media and Broadcast provides such things. We can use the internet, which is partly what we did with the Commonwealth Games one. Mm -hmm. But what about things like low Earth orbit satellites? Pamela, do you want to kind of uh, sure. explain a little bit about what's been happening in the <coughs> in the 5G, uh, the IBC accelerator this year, and, um, and what the possibilities might be? So we started looking at the potential of low Earth orbit satellites during last year's accelerator, and absolutely it was of interest to us because it's affordable, it's you know pretty portable, um, it promised very high speeds, but again. Starlink was in beta mode, so that was the option that we decided to trial because we could get our hands on it. And 
again, really fast download speeds. We need to be able to ensure that we've got that guaranteed upload speed. Um, in terms of business models, initially Starlink was kind of a consumer product. Hmm. We've now seen it go from beta through to potential business plans. Um, Starlink are also now looking at you know deals where they're providing maritime and uh, air coverage. But they seem to be focused on sort of that broadband consumer connectivity in remote areas. Um, so looking to the future and the developments in that area, what we found is that other satellite providers such as OneWeb, Telesat, um, and others are talking more about the medium Earth orbit satellite space as well. And I think that as a vertical, we need to be dealing with people that understand what it is that we need to do and want like to do. So uh, those con conversations, and I think those developments will continue, but Starlink's proved to be a really successful method of providing backhaul and we demonstrated that yesterday on the IBC innovation stage um, where we were transmitting again over the private network with the help of Vislink's uh, mobile viewpoint solution backhauled over Starlink landing here um, and it works you know all of the operators that have got their hands on the uh, LEO dishes have been really impressed by how quick and easy it is to set it up Obviously, there are problems with things like break before make, so you know there can be some degradation and loss of service. But we've also discovered that you know by perhaps using two Starlinks bonded together, that there might be solutions uh, um, that fill that gap. So, so this this is really interesting. So uh, for for those of you who don't know how um, low Earth orbit satellites work, it's a constellation of satellites. There are many flying overhead, and there can be a situation where the satellite that you're currently connected to goes uh, is heading out of view and the new one isn't quite in the right place yet and so you end up with a, a degradation of service for a, a short period of time and as Perminda says this is where if you can then bond that together with a 4G network you can get enough capacity during that uh, that period of degradation to keep going with the broadcast. Yeah, it's MVP amazing. We have done, done some testing around that as well, mm. haven't you? Yes, we've done some testing of, of that, and it works. <coughs> it's a really nice way of, of filling those momentary gaps. And of course, the, the cellular SIMs might cost you some money, and so you want to use those only when necessary. And so you rely, you have your priority towards your Starlink and give a lower priority towards your, your cellular network and use it only when necessary. It works nicely. And I, I've been really impressed with the accelerator this year. The, 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 the vision of doing an event from New Zealand, an, an event from Kenya, an event from Southern Ireland, and then live at the show for the Highland Games in Scotland. And it all worked. It's, it's seriously impressive. So. You have to be careful, though, because what... The, the, only, the only snag with LEO, which is great, it's brilliant for giving two extra backhaul. And if your use case is only video encoded, and you're not overly worried about latency, give or take half a second, um, it's brilliant because you can build in enough buffer to ride out those, those things you just talked about. The problem is if you've got other applications on the back of it, such as data path through the box to give you data control, you can end up getting outside the tolerance of ping times for quite a lot of devices. So we've had this exact use case where things like audio comm systems which require an IP link ping time, the LEO styling will is, is outside the tolerance and then you lose all your, your talkback. So, right. so it's brilliant for certain applications. It's brilliant for video. If you just want to push video and you're happy with a bit of a long latency to ride out those waves, fantastic. But if you're doing more than that and you've got other applications, you have to make sure you're choosing the right solution for each of those applications. So, yeah, thanks for that. What's, what's next? Where are we going with all of this, do you think? Is there, are there improvements in sight? Are there improvements in uh, in the way that 5G is going to be used? In so the way that Neo think, would be used? Yeah, I think we need. Uh, we look. I think we need to productize. This is almost productized, but not quite. The cell system, right? So mm. the cells are still a little bit R and D-ish. I think they need to be migrated into a, a way where they're very easy deployable by the sorts of people that we employ through our third parties like EMG and BRF and other people who would put this sort of system out. Um, at the minute, it still requires the actual cell. Still requires a bit of telco expertise, which probably wouldn't typically be found uh, an outside broadcast. I think, um, yeah, I think you're you right. I think absolutely the next step is going in, into a deployment phase and, and giving up the knowledge and the, the, um, the availability of the equipment to actually go and do that. And so, yes, as we move out of a, a trials fa phase and into a deployment phase, I think that's sort of, there's a sort of seamless nature as, as you do that 
and each, each place you, you learn, and I think that's really where, where we need to be going. But next. one of the interesting things is, because the, the, the um, cellular network core here is software-defined, um, you can actually break it into two halves, and, and the core um, cell core piece is more than capable of being just one in the cloud. So one of the things I think is really interesting is how we take this and we split it into two halves, and only put out the random stuff on the edge, but run the core um, piece in a cloud service, so you haven't got to have on-prem cloud deployment, and it can be run centrally from a team or you know, people that can support it on a much wider scale. That'll really help as well, I think. I think you're right. As, as this technology becomes more and more common than the case for cloud production, um, a, you know, a cloud implementation of a 5G core becomes more compelling as you get down that route. You know, as in the early phases, I think everything in a box, and then at some point, no doubt, um, changes will be made. And then you said more devices, other types of devices, audio devices, talked about you know tablets to do your prompting and i'm sure we'll be you know uh, people will be innovative and think think of other things that you well, want to do will with come it. and you know mm. comm systems and things will come as well i'm quite sure in the next 24 months mm. in the next 24 months okay well we've seen, we've seen the mic it's only a matter of time before you then do the you know, IEM type solution and then i suspect comms manufacturers will start catching up yeah, and radio sure. things will come across and what else are the broadcasters thinking of in this space perminder um, in what respect? The, in terms of the vision of the future, in terms of wh where are we going with the use of 5G networks, where are we going with perhaps the audience with 5G networks? So I think absolutely what we're trying to move towards is being integrated fully with SMPTE 2110, being into those fully digital, digital IP workflows. Um, in terms of the audience, I think you know things like extended reality, augmented reality, fan experiences, 5G is going to enable all of that. Um, looking even further into the future, we can't not use the metaverse <laughs> word and <laughs> think about you know what might be happening with that. Um, and also, you know, 5G is always playing into the emergence of 6G, which is not really that far off on the horizon. So, I think you know the way we create content and the way we reach our audiences and the way the audience engages with our content will all be you know, shaped by how 5G progresses as we see, as we were saying, more devices, different ways of um, the audience connecting with us, um, things like edge compute, you know, will that mm. influence um, you know, the kind of products that end up on the market and the kind of content we're making, so yeah. yeah. If I was to ask each of you what's your 2030 vision for the use of 5G in this broadcast space, what would you say? Start with Andy. Well, truthfully, what we'd really like, because the, the one constraining factor here is as brilliant as this is for news gathering and everything else, all the time you've still got to put a sell out before you can use it, hmm. will always slow down and restrict the really exciting use cases like short notice news gathering, like event coverage. All the time you've got to think about putting the network up before you can actually get going. That's a barrier to entry in terms of speed. Once we get public networks caught catching up with the stuff yeah. that we've talked about for a very long time, I mean, 2018 mm. we were sat here, I think, talking about mm -hmm. it, so not very far away. <laughs> and if I had a pound for every time someone said to me since, you, you know, you talked in 2018 about this, this thing you're going to be doing next <laughs> year. And it's like, oh, it's a bit awkward. No, but seriously, if we, get, if we get that kind of technology where we can look in private spectrum on the public network, where, I mean, I can see the situation now where a story breaks. For us, it'd be a sporting story, maybe outside a football club. Managers resign, but want to get there and get in and quickly and do a story. But in your case, it could be news, regional news, whatever. Um, to then take the power we talked about so far, these low latency applications, uh, all these things, that, that for me would be, would be really exciting. Mm -hmm. I do also think, exactly what said, use cases for customers, where we're trying to bring customers closer to, in our case, you know, our motto is bringing customers closer to the heart of sport. Things like the XR capability, things like the augmented reality glasses, things like where I can see fans being in stadium wearing these things as they get better and better and mm -hmm. they become more and more wearable and more just like normal spectacles. I could see uh, really ex exciting use cases um, for better data aggregation for fans who want to, who would normally at home enjoy a really data rich experience as a fan that you don't get in the stadium. Suddenly you can have best of both that and to fumble in your pocket and get your phone out and be looking down here as well as looking at the game. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a really interesting development on both sides. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm -hmm. David? I think I, I agree with Andy in terms of uh, getting people a more immersive experience. Um, certainly, yes, augmented reality, um, potentially the ability to get more camera views within um, um, at that event, and people can maybe have some freedom to to see what things they want to watch at an event. Um, 
within 2030, I think the pace of change within the cellular technology, we could be on to you know, a 5G plus or, or something else G by, by then. But I think in, in terms of what it provides, I think we're showing that the, the core abilities, the core technologies have been shown here um, in the past year at the event at Saracens at the Commonwealth Games. I think all of that really is the, the way that we have now brought for the broadcast industry um, IP right to the edge. And I think that... Because the other technologies which are catching up at the same time is real-time real um, meta, you know, meta creation, things like augmented humans. And so, for our point of view, from a sports perspective, the, the ability to generate very fast augmented views of pitches and replays, giving us unique perspectives on different angles for, to break down a play. At the minute you have to wait for them to render out, having done the skeletal model building, that stuff will come with the edge compute will come in. So suddenly we were able to do all sorts of much more interesting real-time analysis. Um, like a basically a VAR on speed, but using all this other data we'll have, I think that'll be by 2030. I'd expect us to be seeing that in our in our coverage probably. Excellent. Belinda, any final words? What's your 2030 yeah, vision? Um, <laughs> well, I think ultimately, yeah, absolutely more hardware getting those devices. But you know, let's be aware that there's chipset shortages. Mm -hmm. So you know, maybe <laughs> stuff isn't. Let's hope there's not a chip shortage in 2030. <laughs> we can well, home. Let's, let's hope that by 2030 those <laughs> sorts of issues for. are resolved. Um, but, you know, dare I say it, we, in 2030, will some of us be attending IBC in the metaverse? Yeah. <laughs> will I have a digital twin that can do all the walking for me so that I'm not um, quite so exhausted by the end of it? Maybe. Very good. OK, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Are there any questions from the floor? Anybody have any burning questions? Yes, there's one down there. Thank you. So you, you said you could deploy a network very quickly, but it takes you two weeks to get the license for the Spectrum to use it. So what are your thoughts about, and, and also the spectrum for what is different from the country at the moment? Yeah. So what's your vision for the availability of spectrum for this for private applications for broadcasting? Do you want to take that, Andy? Well, I, I think it's, yeah, you're absolutely right. That is exactly one of the problems. The, the space itself is reserved everywhere, but you just have to go through the application process. I think we do need regulators to catch up. Um, with, um, with some of the technology to enable these things to happen quicker. This is partly why if we had the ability to segregate private space on a public network, we wouldn't have this problem. Mm -hmm. So I think we do need to, to have that conversation mm -hmm. for sure. And I think that's, that's also learnings from the regulators. You know, we can go and, and get a, um, a license for uh, some OFDM use, you know, really quickly now. And because people, uh, because those, those teams who process that are familiar with that's how the world is operating. I think once on, if we think about the UK, once Ofcom are familiar with this is being used for a certain application, mm -hmm. then I think, you know, they will find ways to, to grant those licenses and understand, um, you know, what the dangers are in terms of private 5G cells within the public networks and, and be able to respond to that much more rapidly. In terms of other countries rolling out licensing for 5G and, and public space, um, that's happening at different speeds across the, the globe. A lot of European and countries have, are there with that. And one of the pressures that OFDM is under at the moment is some of that space is being taken away to be dedicated towards 5G type applications and actually moving how you do things today from a, a, an available bandwidth which is being shrunk to something which is growing will, will you know, help to preserve the ability to get those immersive wireless camera shots and make sure that they are there into the future. And, and I, I think, think also all countries will recognise that. So it's also, that's why it's important for us as broadcasters to continue engaging with those standards bodies. So the BBC, for example, works very closely with the EBU and we do a lot of work about why the programme making and special events spectrum is important and how that will translate as the 5G technology develops. And actually, I should probably just plug my colleague's EBU talk, which is happening later at about 2 o'clock on the EBU stand. So if you'd like to find out more about that. How easy, David, is it to change uh, these setups when you go country to country and you're in different spectrum? Is that, a, is that a simple thing? Is that an operational thing? Or is it... So in terms, in terms of the, the UE, the edge device, the transmit on, on the back of the camera, um, those are using commercially available um, cellular modems, and those are being developed in order to fulfill the needs of, of the world globally. And so they have that, that capability within a certain range. You know, there's, there's the, the frequency bands that we've been using within Europe over the past year, N77, N78, in sort of three and a half gigahertz sort of regions. There's talk of using um, much higher frequency bands than that. Obviously, that's going to need slightly different technology. But um, that's, those frequency bands have different properties, um, lower range, for example. 
Um, but um, you can, within the, the cell, within the radio heads, those are, um, at the moment, pretty much dedicated to a certain frequency band. If they did a wide frequency band, then the amount of power, the, the range, would be massively reduced. So you do have to make sure that you have, uh, certainly at the moment, the right radio head for the right, um, the right frequency band. Very good. Any other questions from the floor? This one there. Hi, um, I'm curious to know. Oh, thanks. Um, I'm curious to know what the panel's opinion is on how far we are from being able to use 5G fi or the public network of 5G for remote production. So I know I, I understand obviously for like right now, you know, the infrastructure is not there. You know, if you want to do low, ultra low latency of the theoretical 5G, you know, single digit milli milliseconds, you, you don't have it. So how 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 far are we? Are we one year away? Five years away? What do you think f from your from your experience? Um, so I say a little bit about that. So um, the technology that enables the the public 5G network to be used for broadcasting uncontended, and and so to guarantee that you get your 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 data across is um, is technology called network slicing. That has now been standardised. Some um, um, network operators are doing some very early testing with that. Um, and then will they choose to deploy it on their networks? We don't know. Um, will they see a business case for it? Clearly within the broadcast industry, we can see there's a business case for it. The network uh, providers need, need to see that and, and deploy at, at the pace if, that, that they see right for, for their, their customers. So when will it come? We don't know. <laughs> And so uh, certainly at the moment, there is a gap for private networks and how long yeah. that will be the right choice. Let's see how things evolve in that space. And it's, the public network is still skewed heavily, as Prina said, into download versus upload. Um, so the use case for 5G versus 4G at the minute in the public space is only really latency reduction because there's not a great amount of extra mm. upload bandwidth. There's a little bit, but not enough that really changes the game significantly other than the latency dropping a little bit, potentially. There's a nice sort of triangle that you see when you, when you Google 5G many, many times. You'll see that at one corner of your triangle is the ability to connect many, many different UEs. Another corner of your triangle is the, the ability to have um, very low latency. And at the other corner is, is the ability to have very high data rates. And if you push one, you'll lose something from some of the others. So having the ability for thousands of users to connect and very low latency and high data rate <laughs> altogether is not a sort of combination that you can get all in one. Whereas within a private 5G network, you can go for bias towards a high upload data rate and a low latency and a small num smaller number of devices connected. It's, um Thank you. Any final questions? This one there. Yeah, I think uh, you made a point that some of the, the form factor here could be reduced if you actually move certain elements into cloud or edge. So uh, actually, it's the it's a right, uh, right thing. You know, We need to find that uh, sweet spot, uh, reducing the form factor, seeing if the the operators are going to be ready with the on the public network. Can we move everything to edge and to cloud so hyperscalers? Then I think uh, the, there is a sweet spot, right? Uh, so. I mean, it's, uh, it's a bit difficult for us to, uh, especially uh, as a service provider, should we invest on these things right now? Uh, especially, like you said, uh, down the road, maybe uh, the business case to have a private, I mean, um, uh, do a network uh, slicing or maybe doing prioritization of the existing network would solve the problems of a broadcaster. So the question is, uh, are, we, are, we, are we still in the phase of trialing it out or should we really go commercial? at the space, or like you said, wait for 24 months to really come out with a product offering? Uh, don't wait, don't wait. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, that's a really good question. I don't, I don't know if I know the answer. I think, mm. I, think, I think we need to be aware that it, there are still standards being released with regards to how 5G <coughs> architecture and is going to work. So until we have all of that definition, you're kind of chasing something that yeah. could end up costing you more money than you need it to. So mm -hmm. I think that's definitely an influencing factor right now. I see things more as a evolution rather than a revolution. Mm -hmm. And I think that there will be applications where five now where 5G is absolutely the right thing to do. And um, I think in the future you'll find that there will be more 
um, things, more uh, events where 5G is absolutely the right thing to do and, and will evolve from one thing to another. So things that might be hard in 5G today might be much easier in the future. Things that are hard with the current technology, the OFTM technology, we talked about how that bandwidth is, is being reduced as it's being handed over to other things. So you may find that that's one good reason for you to move as that bandwidth moves. You may find that the benefit of having bi-directional capability, as we had at the Commonwealth Games or remote production, is a really good motivation to make that move to 5G. You may find that doing a wide area event, I'm thinking something like golf, could be um, easier to, um, to set up with a 5G network that is inherently mm. um, IP connected rather than a, a multi-cell um, OFDM network, for example. Those are some good applications where 5G may be right for you now and maybe more things in the future. Very good. Okay, well, I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, clearly, there's a lot of potential here in the short term and also in the longer term. Would you join me in thanking the panel, Andy Beale, David Edwards, Perminda, for their wise words. They'll <laughs> be around if you want to ask more questions, of course, after the panel. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, John.